Greetings again today in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We thank God this beautiful day, auspicious day in which we can meet in God's house and worship and enjoy the good things of the Lord. Uh, we appreciate you being here. May God bless you. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens. And this is Preacher Edward speaking. Now take your Bible today and turn, would you please, to Romans chapter 16. Romans 16 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. I'm reading from page 1210. I do have about 8 or 10 original Schofield Reference Bibles in my study. If you're interested in getting a Bible for Christmas or for someone for Christmas, I can save you about 10 or $12 on the Bible. I'm not in the Bible selling business. I just accumulated these that might help those who like to have the original Schofield Reference Bible. I read the other day about this lady went to the dentist, get a tooth extracted, and when she got back home, she checked the bill and charged her three times more than he used the wood for extracting a tooth. She got on the phone, called the dentist, said, Sir, did you know you charged me three times more than you're supposed to? He said, Now, wait a minute, lady. He said, The reason I did that, he said, You screamed so loud when I pulled your tooth, you scared away two of my patients. So I'm just charging for them, too. Well, I guess that's one way to get the job done. Turning to Romans chapter 16. Now, there may be some of you interested in our proposed Holy Land tour. This is the best one price-wise we have offered. You ought to try to go. Maybe some of you out there listening, your pastor's never been, or your pastor's wife. Why don't you get together in your church and send them to the Holy Land? No greater thing could you do for them for Christmas, or just to help them. And because they'll accumulate knowledge there, they'd never get out of the seminary equivalent to more than uh, two or three years in a seminary in, in that respect. I'll be glad to mail you a brochure. Uh, if you call me or come to see me, I'll be glad to talk with you about it. And price-wise, you'll never beat this price. And all the thing you need to do now is get a, your name on the list, get a couple of hundred dollars down, and then the rest will be due after the first of the year. Now, the tour is March the 7th, and that'll be here before you know it. First thing you know, it'll be Christmas, and then, of course, time to go to the Holy Land. And I wish you'd think about it. Maybe some of you visitors here today, you'd like to consider going. Get your brochure. Let me talk with you about it. Now, this is a faith ministry. I depend upon you that love God to help keep this program on the air. This entire hour is an hour by faith, and I pay for this time as God's people help me to do so. And I have five books on Bible questions and answers everyone should know. 150 Bible questions and answers. And each one of these books, they're very unique. They've been asked me over the years. I've been on the radio more than 40 years. And many of these have been asked me since I've been on the radio. And you can get all five of these books for a gift of $10. Or you can get one of them for a gift of $2. On page 2... Uh, book number four, you'll find the answer to these questions. When did the Lord send lions among the people to destroy them? What did Hezekiah call the brazen serpent that Moses had made? What lad took a lion by the beard and slew him? Where are the nails that were driven in the hands of Jesus referred to in the Bible? What man built 23 cities? Where does it say in the Bible that men were slain for cattle rustling? Where is tear, the tear bottle mentioned in the Bible? Where in the Bible did Jesus call a man the name of an animal? What miracle is mentioned by all four gospel writers? Who built the little town of Bethlehem? What men in the Bible had 60 daughters? Where is the middle verse of the Bible? What preacher was delivered lest he be torn to pieces by the people? What are the only two books in the Bible named for a woman? What and where in the Bible did Jesus ever restore the missing part of a person's body? Who asked the question, Shall a man fill his belly with the east wind? 
These questions, you find answered on page two of book number four. In writing in, you can request a list of our cassette tape. We have 350 listed, uh, listed rather. And today's tape will be tape number 359. I'm speaking on great mysteries in the Bible. You can call for the tape by the title, Great Mysteries in the Bible, or you can call it by number, page 359, write in and get it for a gift of $3 for a radio expense. So write in, you can request it in your Christmas card or by letter, and we'd be glad to get the list out to you. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. You pray for me and write to me next week. I appreciate it so very much. Romans chapter 16, verses 25 through 27. Page 1210 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. And you turn there quickly and follow me in the scriptures. Now to him that is in power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Now Paul is talking here about the great mystery it is kept secret and revealed to the apostles, especially Apostle Paul, some of the great mysteries that you find in the Bible. I want to mention a few of these today, and you may check the scriptures and reread it for yourselves and find out about some of the great mysteries that you find recorded in the Word of God. Now God saved Paul and revealed to him these great mysteries. In Romans chapter 11 and verse 25, Paul said, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel unto the fullness the Gentiles be come in. Now that's a mystery of Israel's rejection. It's a great mystery. Paul explains it in the Bible and tells you why God rejected Israel and how long Israel would be rejected. Now I mentioned the fullness of the Gentiles. He said the great mystery here is that Israel and blindness in parts happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. I'll explain to you in a moment what that means. Now there's a difference between the time of the Gentiles and the fullness of the Gentiles. Now remember, every person that's not a Jew is a Gentile. And God said blindness in part has happened to Israel, happened to the Jew, unto the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Now what he means by that is, blindness in part has happened to Israel, until God calls out the church, that is, until the time of the grace age is over, which will be at the rapture, now that time, of course, will extend until the rapture, and then at the rapture, the fullness of the Gentiles will be completed when the rapture takes place. Now it started on the day of Pentecost, and God is calling out a people from among the Gentiles for His name. That's a great mystery. Now that's the fullness of the Gentiles. Now that's the time of the Gentiles mentioned in Luke chapter 21 and verse 24. Now there's a difference between the fullness of the Gentiles and the time of the Gentiles. Now the time of the Gentiles had its beginning back with Nebuchadnezzar when that Gentile ruler went in and conquered uh, the Jews and brought them captive into Babylon. That was beginning of the reign of the time of the Gentiles. And that time is still in operation today and will be completed at the end of the tribulation period. Now when Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom upon the earth, he will end the time of the Gentiles. That time is at the end of the tribulation when Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom. So you see there's a difference between the fullness of the Gentiles and the time of the Gentiles. And so God revealed this great mystery to Paul and he passed it on to us. Secondly, there's a mystery of the body of Christ. Now according to Ephesians chapter 3 and the first six verses, 
And I won't take time to read them. You can read them for yourself. You will find there the mystery of the body of Christ. Now you must remember that Christ is the head and we are the body. Every saved person that's been saved since the beginning of the church age becomes part of that body. Somewhere in that body you have been placed as a true born again believer. I don't know where you're placed. I don't know where I'm placed. But somewhere in that body you have been placed and you belong to the body of Christ. And God is building a body, a body for his son Jesus. And Christ is the head and we of the body. Someone said one time, I know where I am in the body. And another person said, where brother? He said, I'm the uh, coin on the little toe. So every time I move, somebody steps on it. He said, that's where I am. Well, now we don't know where we are. But somewhere in that body we have been placed by the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, the Bible says, By one Spirit are we baptized into the body of Christ. So the moment you were saved, the Holy Spirit of God baptized you, or buried you, or placed you in the body of Jesus Christ. And somewhere today you are found in that body. God knows where you are. You don't know, but God knows. I don't know, but God knows. But somewhere I've been placed in that body. And that's a great mystery. And Paul said God is building a body for his son Jesus. And the body is called the church of the firstborn. Called the church of the living God. And you're part of that church. You've been placed into the body of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. Now you didn't earn that. You didn't work your way and you didn't buy that. That came as a gift from God. God gave you salvation, placing you in the body of Jesus Christ. And you become part of that body and you will remain there until the very end. You must remember that. If you're in the body of Christ, you'll always be in the body of Christ. And you'll be part of the body and he's the head according to the Bible. That is a great a mystery. Now, it may sound to some of you, maybe in the radio list of artists, a little confusing, but uh, you'll have to be saved and understand the things of God to understand the real meaning of the body of Christ. Christ being the head in heaven, we're the body down here. And you keep that in mind. Then we move to number three, and that is the mystery of the bride of Christ, which is the church. Now, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So Paul is talking here about the bride of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, Paul said, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He's talking there about the church. Paul said, I've, I've introduced you, I've espoused you to one husband, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. I present you to him. Now, you belong to the bride of Christ. Now, you have a theory taught by some, especially out west, maybe out in Texas. There's a lot of Baptist briders out there. Uh, they think only the Baptist belong to the bride of Christ, but that's wrong. Every true born again believer, whether you be a Baptist or Presbyterian, a Methodist or whatnot, if you're truly saved, you belong to the bride of Christ to be. Now God is calling out a bride for his son. You remember Abraham sent Eliezer across the desert to secure a bride for his son Isaac. And he brought that bride back, and there she married Isaac, of course. There was a bride sought for for his son, Abraham being a type of God, Isaac a type of Christ, and the servant Eliezer, we believe, to be the name of the servant, is a type of the Holy Spirit. He goes and gets Rebecca, brings her back, and there she marries Isaac. She becomes the bride of Isaac. That's exactly what the Holy Spirit is doing today. He's down here bringing out of the Gentiles and what few Jews will believe, a people or a bride to be of Christ. 
And each time a person is born again, placed in Christ, when he is born again, and that only happens one time, he's placed into the bride of Christ. Now, Christ is the bridegroom, and we are the bride-to-be. Now, you must remember that. And if you're saved, you're part of the bride of Christ. One of these days, I'm going to speak on the marriage supper of the Lamb, where the marriage supper will take place after the wedding. And then the honeymoon, we'll be speaking about that one of these Sunday mornings, the Lord willing. But anyway, we find that we are the bride of Jesus Christ. We belong to him. He's the bridegroom. And so we must keep that in mind as we sojourn. Now, you didn't buy your way into the bride of Christ, that position. You didn't earn your way there. You didn't deserve that. That's a gift from God through grace, through faith. God gave you salvation. God placed you in the bride of Christ. Now, when Jesus comes back down to the earth to set up his kingdom up on the earth, we'll come back with him and we'll reign with him from Jerusalem as his bride. That's the true church, the church of Jesus Christ, the born again ones. We belong to that body with the bride of Christ. We'll come back with him and reign with him in our glorified bodies. At the same time, there'll be the Jewish people and others on the earth. There'll be God's earthly people. We will be God's heavenly people. Now, that's a sermon within itself. We won't have time to go into that, but that's what's going to happen. We belong to the bride of Christ. He's coming for us. The bridegroom is coming for us. And then we'll be married to him, of course. And we sit down at the marriage supper. And then on the honeymoon, we'll come. And I won't have time to go into that. Number four, that is the great mystery of the incarnation of the Son of God. Now we're approaching Christmas season. And the Bible tells us that there would be a child born by a virgin. His name should be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. God was incarnated in the flesh. The Bible said a woman uh, there would give birth to a child. And there that child, of course, is, it will be the Son of God. And there God's incarnated in that little body. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, and there placed in the manger, there in the cow stall, that little baby there was God in flesh. He was incarnated in that flesh. Now the Bible says that Mary conceived, not by Joseph, but by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost overshadowed her and she conceived. And the Bible said that holy thing is the Son of God, is Jesus. Now whenever she, whenever she conceived by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost completely surrounded that body, that seed, surrounded it and kept it pure from any sin that might have been in the body of Mary. Now Mary had a sinful body because she was a descendant of Adam. And she inherited a sinful body. And in her body, in her bloodstream, there was sin. That old Adamic nature. And there the Holy Spirit, whenever she conceived of the Holy Spirit, there the Holy Spirit completely surrounded that seed. And in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 5, the Bible says, A body has thou provided me, O God. Now God provided that body... There, the Son of God, God provided that. God built that body. And when that body was born and placed there in the stall in the manger in Bethlehem, there was a body that had no taint of sin in it. No taint of sin. Completely built by God Himself. A perfect body. And that was God Himself that entered into that body and incarnated Himself in that body. Now listen to the Scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. But without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached of the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. So God tells you there in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 that God was incarnate in that little body, the body of Jesus. Now, when they came and looked on that body, the wise men, the shepherds, they looked at God. Jesus was very God and now very man, the Bible tells us. So that's the great mystery. God incarnated in a little body 
and came upon this earth and did what he came to do and went back to heaven. Number five, there's a mystery of iniquity. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the, bright, the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now he's speaking here about the mystery of iniquity. He's talking here about the coming Antichrist and the way sins are bounding in the earth. Oh, yesterday I looked at a video a tape that uh, my daughter Gay let me look at that she uh, had uh, borrowed from someone for me to see, me to look at on the on devil worship. I'm telling you that thing was so disturbing to see what was happening in devil worship in the world today. And how they're making uh, sacrifice in human beings. And it's terrible. And it told about a lieutenant colonel in the army. That's uh, the devil's preacher out here in California. And he has a devil's church. And yet he's in the army, a lieutenant colonel. And being paid by your taxpayer ten money. And there he worships the devil. He's the priest of the devil. He's the minister of the devil. He has a church called the Devil's Church. And yet at the same time, being supported by uh, the taxpayer's money. He ought to be kicked out of the army completely. I can't understand why they'd keep a man like that. Encouraging evil. Now what I'm saying is this. There's more and more devil worship today in the land on the increase than you're aware of. If you can see that uh, video, if you can, I think they showed it on TV and somebody made a copy of it. If you can see that thing, it'll wake you up. You better keep your eyes on your children. They begin to act a little strange. All this comes through dope and alcohol and this rock and roll music and this ungodly stuff that's shown through Hollywood today. And it hooks your children, get them enticed. And these lyrics and many of these hard rock songs are in spite of the devil and they get your children hooked on them, and they go into devil worship. Showed a young boy, a very handsome young man. He and three others uh, took one of their group and, and killed a man and a young boy and uh, sacrificed him on the altar. And today he's in prison for the rest of his days. Now, wasn't that a stupid thing to do? They'll kill a young, fine-looking young boy and then have to go into prison and spend the rest of his days. And he's a fine, handsome-looking young man. That's what the devil will do for you. And the devil worship today is on the increase. It's abounding more and more. And you're going to see more and more of it as you move toward the end. And much of it is presented to your children through TV. That's some of the most corrupt things today being shown through TV. Violence of all kind that uh, you, you wouldn't imagine years ago. That they show such stuff as that through TV. And your children sit there and look at that stuff day in and day out. And they go out and buy these uh, videotapes with all this, the uh, uh, sex and the violence and things shown on those tapes. And the hard rock music and all that kind of stuff. And they feed on it. And all of that's out of the pit of hell itself. And our leaders in the nation don't seem to be doing anything about it. It's getting worse all the time. They're getting bolder and bolder as what they show today on the TV screen. And uh, much of it, most of the stuff shown today on the TV screen is not decent enough for your children to look at. And you better believe that. Now you turn them loose, let them look at what they want to, listen to what they want to, play this hard rock junk music and all that kind of stuff, much of it on even on what is so-called so -called country music and western music and some even call gospel songs. It's not fit for a decent person to listen to. Much of, much of it is. Now you need to realize that. And then there's the mystery of iniquity. It's on the increase, getting worse, because I believe that this great mystery that Paul is really talking about here, which is the Antichrist, I believe he's in the world today alive. We won't know who he is, and we won't know until after the rapture. The church will be taken out in the world or no, but I believe he's alive in the world today. And that's the reason we have so much evil in the land today is because the Antichrist is alive. I believe that. I can't prove that, but I believe that. That's a mystery of a nucleus now working in the land. And it's getting worse and going to get worse. You haven't seen this thing yet. You're going to have the battle of your life trying to protect your children from the evil one as they move on toward the end. 
And I'm not a pessimist, I'm a truthist. I'm trying to warn you about what's happening. And then we come to mystery number six, and that's the mystery of the great harlot. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 5, upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abomination of the earth. Now this is a great mystery today as what's going to happen. In the end time, one of the major religions in the world today, which has its headquarters on uh, seven hills, the Bible tells you here, all false religions is going to be brought under the control of this one religion. And this one religion will dominate the entire religious system of the entire world for a period of time. And the, it's called the great harlot, the mother of harlots. And it says it has blood on it. It's killed many saints. Well, you don't have to, you check up on history, read a little bit about some religions, you'll find out exactly what I'm talking about today and who did this. And she's a mother of harlots. And she'll, she'll eventually control all religions in the world. And the ecumenical movement in the land today is moving in that direction. Much of the charismatic movement today is moving in that direction. And the, the world church is being formed. That's coming a one world church. It'll be headed up by the mother of harlots and the false prophet working with the Antichrist for a period of time. After a period of time, it'll be destroyed, but it's going to happen, and all major religions are going to be headed up on the one world dominion of religious movements in the land today. You must keep that in mind. That's a great mystery. The mystery of the great heart of the Revelation, chapter 17. Number seven, you have the mystery of the rapture of the church. Now, that's a great mystery. Now, let me read some scripture. In 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 1 and 51 and 52, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised in Corinth, where we shall be changed. That's a mystery of the rapture. Now, the rapture is that time when Jesus descends from heaven with a great shout and the voice of the archangel, and will bring out of the grave all the bodies of our loved ones, that's been planted in the grave. They'll come out. As they come out of that grave, God's going to translate and transmigrate every saved person on the earth to meet him in the air. And that's known as the rapture. You may be standing by the grave of your loved one. The rapture takes place. Out will come that body. You'll join with that body. Up you'll go to meet Jesus in the air. Now that's going to happen. The great mystery of the rapture when God brings out the dead saints and translates the live saints and they go out to meet Jesus together in the air. You find that also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13 through 18. Number 8 you have the mystery of the seven stars in Christ's right hand. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 1 verses 16 through 16 and 20. And he had in his right hand seven stars. The mystery of uh, the seven stars was our source in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which our source are the seven churches. That's Revelation chapter 1, last book in the Bible. You have the mystery of the stars in the right hand of God. And there's a star for each uh, church uh, there in Asia Minor. These stars represent the ministers or the pastors of those seven churches. And they're in the right hand of God. And today, positionally speaking, the pastor, as it were, is controlled by the right hand of God, the place of authority. And God holds him responsible for his church. He's the key man in the church. God holds him responsible. And God said for him to take the oversight of his flock and guard them and feed them and watch over them and help them and love them and pray for them. Oh, you may say, preach it. Now, maybe the church won't let him. God said, take it. God said for the pastor, take the oversight thereof. 
and love his people, feed his people, help his people, encourage his people, and do what he can for his people, and lead them in the right way and defend them from all cults and false doctrines. That's a pastor's responsibility. Position of speaking is in God's right hand, and God holds him responsible. And he's to be a man and cover all the ground he stands on, and he's the man with authority in the pulpit, and God has given him that position. When God called him to preach, God gives him that position as the pastor. The great mystery of the seven stars, the Bible tells. And finally, there's a mystery of the new birth. The Bible says, Galatians chapter 1, verses 27 and 28, To whom God would have known what is the riches, the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. There you have the mystery of the new birth. The new birth is a mystery. There's only two births. There's the first birth and the second birth, or the old birth, the new birth. You're only born twice. Now, the first time you were born into the home of your parents. The second time you were born into the family of God. I was born the first time out here in Madison County between Danielsville and Comer at a little place called Bullock's Mill Community. It used to be an old mill there. And I was born there uh, to my mother and daddy in the Edwards family. I was born at home so I could be with my mother. Now I was born out there in the country and then I was born the second time over in Greenville, South Carolina. Now that was where I was born the second time. I was born out there and the second time in 1940. I'm not going to tell you when I was born the first time because uh, you might think I'm older than what I am. And so anyway, I've been born twice. And there's only two births. That's the physical birth and the spiritual birth. Now if you haven't been born the second time, you're in sad shape. If you die without having been born the second time, you just certainly go to hell as you listen to me today. And every person, as he reaches the age of accountability, when God can hold him accountable for what he knows, then he's to be born again or he won't go to heaven. And some reach that age earlier than others. And so you're born by the Spirit of God, which is a great mystery. And the Spirit of God gives birth to your soul. The Word of God is planted, the seed of God is planted in your heart by the preacher or by the soul winner or the teacher or whatnot, or as you read the Word, is planted in your heart and the Holy Ghost then regenerates. He makes that alive and you become alive spiritually just like that. Now if you're not saved, you're not alive spiritually, you're alive physically. But you're dead spiritually, dead toward God. You're dead. you just as dead toward God as this pew out here. But the moment you're saved, you're quickened, and you're made alive, and you have a connection with God that's given you by the Holy Spirit. He does that. And that's what's called the new birth. Right then, you're born into the family of God and become a child of God, a son of God, a daughter of God. And that's a great mystery. And that happened. You enjoy every church in the country. You enjoy so many churches. Go down the river. The tadpoles recognize your serial number. Still go to hell. Beloved, you have to be born by the Spirit of God. Church membership, water baptism, the communion service, reformation, education. None of these things will get you to heaven. You've got to be born again. Born by the Spirit of God and the Word of God. And then after that, you ought to find yourself a good fundamental Bible believing church and get in there and be baptized and work with God's people. That you ought to do. The great mystery of the new birth. If you've never been born again, you ought to get born again now before you die and go to hell. God's not going to let anybody go to heaven unless they've been born again. If he did, everybody in hell would raise up and point the finger at God and said, You're not just. God's not going to let anybody go to heaven unless they're born again first. Now you must remember that. And a little emphasis to go there through God's grace. But not people that reach age of accountability. They'll die without God, according to the Bible. That's a great man one time, yonder in New York. He died, and they came to preach his funeral. People from all over town came, and they wept, and they put flowers in his coffin. And, 
And the preacher said, this is one of the greatest workers for God the uh, city of New York's ever had. And this man was a bum on the street. I mean, he was a bum. He was a drunk. He was a dope addict. And one day sitting on the street, caught a long beard, bleary-eyed, matted hair, ragged clothes, cold and hungry, a Christian worker came up to him and said, Sir, let me tell you about Jesus. I want to help you. He said, I, I need a coat. I'm about to freeze to death. That Christian worker took his coat off, gave it to the man, he put it on, and he told him about Jesus and won him to God. That man became one of the greatest workers for God in the city of New York and won more people to God than the other one man that's picked up off the street in the city of New York. Because that one missionary was willing to take his coat off, put it on that man, and sit down in the cold and tell him about Jesus. And this man was glorious.